Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay the entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Have you ever heard the saying, be careful what you pray for, because you might just get it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So then here's a prayer that many of us pray at least once a week. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And every time we pray that, we should be wondering, are we seriously wanting that sort of quid pro quo with God. The psalmist says, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. That's great news. We mess up. We ask God for forgiveness. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, and so God forgives us. But when someone does us wrong, when someone does us dirty, we tend to say not so fast. We're not so full of compassion and mercy. We are not slow to anger and of great kindness. We are much more likely to be quick to anger and full of, let's just say, colorful language. And yet this is how Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We really should be careful what we pray for. In this morning's gospel, Peter comes to Jesus and asks, Lord, if someone sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Peter had heard Jesus talking about forgiveness, and he wants to know more. And Peter must have done some of his homework, too, because there is an ancient rabbinic tradition that says a person should forgive one who has sinned against him as many as four times. So Peter earnest and eager, tries to be even more generous than the rabbis. And he adds three more times. He asks, should I forgive a person even up to seven times? Now, seven times is a lot. It's three more than the rabbis. It's a lot of times to turn and forgive someone who has wronged you. So maybe Peter is expecting or hoping that Jesus will praise him for even suggesting so much forgiveness. But no, Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 77 times. New Testament scholars debate whether the Greek text means 77 times or 70 times, seven times. But that's kind of beside the point, because either way, Jesus is holding up an enormous number, a number so big that we can't even begin to calculate what it would be in terms of forgiveness. 
Peter wants some kind of rule or measurement. So he opens his arms wide and he says, this much, Lord? Should I forget even this much? And Jesus says, no, more than that. You're not even using the right scale, Peter. As far as the east is from the west, that's how much you should forgive. It's such an enormous amount of forgiveness, it would be senseless to even try to calculate how much or how often. There's been a fair amount of social science research on forgiveness, as it turns out. And it turns out, too, that forgiveness is actually good for you. People who forgive have lower levels of anger, anxiety, and depression, and are more emotionally stable, they find. Researchers Christopher Peterson and Martin Seligman, in their book, Character, Strengths, and Virtues, list forgiveness as one of 24 character strengths that make for a good life and that contribute to human well-being. One instrument designed to assess how forgiving you are is known as the um, forgiveness likelihood skill. It gives 10 scenarios of wrongdoing and then asks the participants to indicate their likelihood to forgive on a scale from very unlikely to very likely. Here's a couple of the items. You share something embarrassing about yourself to a friend who promises to keep the information confidential. However, the friend breaks his promise and proceeds to tell several other people. On a scale from zero to five, with five being very likely, what is the likelihood that you would forgive that friend? Here's another. A family member, this time, a family member humiliates you in front of others by sharing a story about you when you were younger that you didn't want anyone else to know. What's the likelihood that you would choose to forgive that family member? Or this, a stranger breaks into your house, steals a substantial amount of money and other things from you that you cherish. What's the likelihood that you would choose to forgive the stranger? How are we doing so far? It seems as though Peter comes to Jesus with his own version of the forgiveness likelihood skill. Peter's question, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Is like asking, how many times on a scale from zero to seven must I forgive somebody? And Jesus' answer is literally off the scale. Not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Jesus is not saying that Peter needs to recalibrate his forgiveness likelihood skill. I really don't think if Peter had asked, how many times should I forgive, as many as 77 times, that maybe Jesus then would have said, uh, yeah, 77, that seems about right. Rather, I think Jesus' response is a way of saying the question and what it's trying to measure are not quite right. The psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. It's pretty hard to put a number on that kind of forgiveness. And yet many of us still sympathize with Peter, don't we? It seems to us that following Jesus ought to make some difference in our lives. He tells us to forgive those who have sinned against us. He tells us, love your enemies. He says our righteousness ought to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So, okay, we want to follow and we're trying the best we can. But maybe like Peter, we would also like some benchmarks to know, you know, how we're doing. We may think Peter asking Jesus if he ought to forgive someone as many as seven times is a reasonable request in our walk with Christ. We've probably even asked ourselves from time to time, am I doing this right? But that very question may be part of the problem. The spiritual danger is that when we focus on our virtue and character strengths, we may become a bit too preoccupied with ourselves. And the real danger happens when we start thinking of our character strengths as accomplishments of our noble, virtuous, righteous selves. Here we can too easily slide into self-righteousness, that smug attitude that knows what real forgiveness is. 
who is a truly forgiving person and who is not, who deserves forgiveness and who does not, and maybe even the extent and limits of forgiveness. Seven times seems about right. It's easy to forget that while our character strengths and virtues may for sure glorify God, as we put it, when it comes to the gospel, God doesn't just deal with parts of us, the noble bits that we would like to put on display, just those. But rather, God seeks a relationship with whole human beings, with every thought, word, and deed, everything, absolutely everything that we are and that whatever we do, virtuous or not. And when we remember this, none of us, saints or sinners, people who are off the charts on the forgiveness scale and those of us who still struggle to forgive at all, have a leg to stand on. We are all utterly dependent on the unconditional, unearned grace and mercy of Christ, who has removed our sins as far as the East is from the West. Maybe that's why Jesus tells Peter the story about the unforgiving servant, a story where the numbers don't add up because the numbers can't be added up when it comes to what God has done for us. In the story, a servant owes the king 10,000 talents. Now that is a crazy number. A single talent was worth more than 15 years of daily wages. So when Jesus says the servant owed the king 10,000 talents, He's effectively saying that he owed him, um, we might say, a bazillion dollars. The servant couldn't pay back that debt. So the king orders him and everything he has to be sold off. So the servant falls on his knees and he begs for an extension. It promises that if he does get some extra time, he'll pay everything back. And we don't know if we are to laugh at him or to pity him. Because there's no way that servant will ever be able to pay back the king. Maybe the king was amused because he responds to this ridiculous request with an amazing act. Since there is no way the slave will ever be able to pay back what he owes, the king just forgives the debt entirely, every last cent, and he sets the slave free. Yet when the servant, who has just been forgiven a debt of a bazillion dollars, runs into a guy who owes him about a hundred denarii, which amounts to a few bucks in comparison to what he had owed the king, the other guy had owed the king. What does he do? Well, he grabs that poor guy by the throat and demands that he better pay up. And when the king finds out what that servant, for whom he had just forgiven an unimaginable amount, wouldn't forgive that pittance that was owed him by another, he had the servant thrown into prison. So Jesus reframes the entire question. When it comes to forgiveness, we are all like servants who owe our Lord and King more than we can ever imagine. Try as we may to repay our debt through our character strengths and our virtues or our willingness to forgive as many as seven times, we will never be able to pay back all that we owe to God. But the good news is that even so, God forgives us anyway and completely. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has taken upon God's self all our sins and debts and has forgiven them. Completely, irrevocably, utterly forgiven and healed by Jesus, God is the God who forgives. We forgive then because God forgives. The forgiveness that we are to pass on to others is the forgiveness we have in union with Christ. Not because we are moral heroes or because we are looking out for our own health and well-being, but because we ourselves are forgiven sinners. Forgiveness may well be a character strength and a virtue. It probably does contribute to leading a good and happy life. And saints like Peter probably do score more highly on forgiveness likelihood scales. But Jesus reminds us when it comes to our ability and need to be forgiven, we are all of us, all of us, those of us who have met, who have great character strengths and those of us who do not, penitents, debtors, we are all 
just kneeling at the foot of the cross. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Be careful what you pray for. You might just get it. 